Hey, welcome back to ZK Master Tech. Today it is tractor time and we're going to inspect this 8320RT and we'll go over all the things that you need to check for and what we inspect for on a 8RT tractor. Um, Caleb's going to get everything finished up on the planner so we might be bouncing back a little bit back and forth uh, getting the planner wrapped up but today we're going to start the tractor inspection so let's check it out. Okay, to start things off, I wanted to show you guys this toolbox from NDY that you can get from Sloan's Express. And this toolbox will mount up on the wing right up here on this vac tube. And this one actually is for a 12 or 16 rail planter, but the only thing that's different are these brackets. The boxes are all the same. Um, you open up the lid on this box and it's got a really nice seal and we got some parts in here so you guys can get a kind of a feel of how big this uh, box really is where you could put um, a bunch of different planter parts in here you could put tools in here you know it's long enough where you could put a decent pry bar in here if you wanted to um, comes with the instructions of how to mount it to the vac tube and this is a real nice addition to your planter where you can store a bunch of extra parts or tools so you can work on your planter all right, so here we got the here we got the beast that's going to be pulling this high-speed planter. This is a model year 18 John Deere 8320RT. So the 8 means that it's a 8 series tractor. The 320 means that it's a 320 horsepower. Um, the RT means that it's a track machine. So if it has wheels, it's an R. If it has two tracks, it's an RT. And then if it's a four track, it's an 8RX. So let's get up in the cab and, you know, kind of look around, see how many hours this thing's got. So we kind of got an idea of uh, the hours on the machine so we know what things to look for. So it's got leather. It's got a little mini fridge in here. We've got the, the new style armrest. Um, what's interesting about this tractor, it, it is an IVT transmission, but it has a, a left-handed reverser. So um, from my, my neck of the woods, we don't normally have this here. I think somebody um, ordered this special whenever they ordered this tractor to have this left-handed reverser. So you'll have neutral up here, parks here, and then you just shuttle shift back and forth for forward and reverse then here you control your your speed so you got a, a, a one speed and then a two speed so the farther you go up in the slot the faster you go and then you have a scroll wheel right here where you can dial in um, up on your your corner post display kind of you can go by the tenth of the mile an hour so when he's pulling the planner you know when he wants to go a little faster, you know, he can just dial this scroll wheel in to dial the exact speed he wants to go. So that's pretty cool. Don't normally um, see left-handed reversers on an 8R with an IVT. Just want to kick the key on here. Let her boot up. It takes a while to boot up the first time that you start the tractor after it's set a while. Okay. So here we got our new Gen 4 display here. And our engine hours are right here. So looks like we got 1,513.9 hours on this rig. It's wanting uh, a remote software update. So um, Deere and the dealership, we can send um, payloads for software updates to the machine itself and you can install the payload from the display here kind of like a like a cell phone update works so 
that's pretty cool. Um, here we got our exhaust filter cleaning. We can turn this off in case we wanted to um, have this machine parked inside and we didn't want it to regen while it's sitting next to the semi or whatever. So, you know, we could go in and, and turn that off right here and switch it off. But you wanna make sure you switch that back on. Bad things could happen. And then here you'll see your um, park regen. So this button, if it's, if it's grayed out and you can't push it, it doesn't need it. But if you're setting codes for the exhaust filter being restricted, um, I guess in a certain level, you know, this button will be where you can push it and do a park regeneration yourself. So we'll go in and check the, the codes on this tractor. So I went to um, menu and we go to system, diagnostic center, and then we'll go down to trouble codes and it'll bring up all the codes that are either on the planner or the tractor because everything's tied into the CAN bus now, right? So, looks like we just have a bunch of planner codes just probably from unhooking harnesses and hooking them back up, that kind of stuff. Let's see, here we go. So this is a steering code, so if you got a uh, TMA, TSA, TSB, um, though that is your, this, this has two steering controllers, so we've got four different, um, acronyms for steering controllers. Steering motor speed extremely high, but the count's only one, you know, everything's inactive so far. And then this is a real common code that you'll see on a track tractor. This is a steering system redundancy loss. And a lot of guys will call in with this code, but this code sets because of another steering code has set. And basically this is just warning you that the steering system has been derated. So if, if you have this code, you gotta get to the root cause of why this code's coming up. And it could be because of something like this, you know, steering motor speed extremely high. And then we could go in and hook up our laptop and we could see at what engine hour this one set and see if it matched up with this one. So, um, but there's, there's some other codes here that could cause that as well. Primary pump pressure, extremely low. Um, that could either be because we got really low on hydraulic oil or it could be the pressure sensor itself for the main hydraulic pump. So what we're going to do is just clear everything out and then I'm going to go in and when I do the inspection, now I have kind of an idea of the codes that were in it. So I kind of have some target areas that I'm going to hit and, and, and look at. So I'll just clear them and we'll see what comes back. And this one's just, just because they're working on the planner right now, so we're not going to worry about that. And this one's just because we don't have GPS position because we're in the shop here. Okay. So now we'll just go ahead and fire this thing up. And it starts good, so we know our batteries are good and charged. So you've seen that, that flashing so that, of that yellow exclamation point? That, that just means that this tractor is going through its startup check. So it's, it's doing running tests for the, the steering um, and making sure that our pressures and everything are all good. So here's that remote software update. We're not gonna worry about that right now. Um, so once we get the machine running, you know, we'll, we'll make sure we've got um, good oil pressure so we got 50 PSI, we're charging, um, 14 and a half volts, so that's good there. Then we'll go in and, you know, we'll turn the, the AC system on, turn the temperature down, make sure it blows cold air. We'll go in and turn the lights on.
So when you turn the light switch on, you'll get this page that comes up and then you can do custom um, light settings and you can control each individual light on the machine. So, and then you can switch between setting one and setting two right here. And then we'll turn our hazards on, turn our beacon lights on. They're flashing. And I'll go around the tractor and make sure all the lights are working while that stuff's on. We already know that our PTO works because we were running the generator there. We know all our SCV works. Um, nothing's leaking down on the planter, no leaks uh, externally on the SCVs, so we know that's good. Okay, now we'll just shut everything down and, uh, and, and well, normally I would go out and I would drive this tractor around and when I drive a 8RT tractor, I'm moving the steering back and forth as I'm traveling and I want to make sure that um, the steering is symmetrical. So I'm basically, I'm checking the sensitivity on how easy is it to steer left versus right. So sometimes when your steering needs a calibration, whenever you turn to the left, it, it might be really sluggish and not turn as fast, but when you turn to the right, it might turn really quick. And that's what I mean about um, the steering not being symmetrical. So if it's not, we could go in and do a steering calibration and it usually fixes that problem. Well, and this also has a you know, an air ride seat in it. So we wanna you know, make sure the compressor is kicking on and it has the ability to pump up the seat and lift me up which it does, so, you know, everything's good there. All right, looks like all our lights are working. These LED lights are really bright. Beacon lights going. And if we have a, a light burned out, it'll actually set a code for it. Looks like everything's working. All right, so we're gonna get the hood popped on this guy. Open this guy up. And then we're just gonna go ahead and take all these shields off here so we can get into the fan drive and the batteries and check all that stuff out. Okay, now, so to get this black shield off, we've got 113 there, and then we've got two right here and we can get this off so we can get into the fan drive and look that all over. Okay, so what we have here is a final tier four nine liter engine. Um, final tier four means that it has def um, and it also has a fuel dosing system on it. So if it's a IT4, it doesn't have def. If it's a final tier four, it's got def. Um, def means diesel exhaust fluid. Um, so it has an SCR system um, put on this tractor. And when we're checking over these engines, you know, we're, we're mainly looking for leaks, any coolant leaks, um, exhaust leaks, oil leaks, stuff like that. So, you know, we'll do a good visual inspection all over this engine and make sure nothing's leaking and everything's happy. So um, the first thing I like to do once I get these shields off is I like to um, go into the fan drive and check that because that's a you know pretty big maintenance item that we spend a lot of time on. Now, obviously, I've done quite a few videos on fan drives, so let's check out this fan drive. Okay, so here we're looking at the fan drive. So this is um, a variable speed fan drive system that is running this fan for the coolers um, to keep everything nice and cool. So, you know, this has the ability to um, speed and slow, speed up the fan and slow it down, you know, independently of engine speed, you know, so it's the, the ECU is looking at inputs like engine temperature and, you know, coolant temperature, hydraulic temperature, if your AC is on or not, and then it's going to control this fan hydraulically. Um, there's a fan control valve, and I've kind of showed this on my other videos, but um, that control valve is then sending oil into this line right here. And then there's pistons inside of this fan drive that is pushing against this shiv here. 
and this shiv is moving in or out, causing the belt to either go in or out of this driven to make it go slower or faster. So this one's kind of a, a unique setup because it has a dry driven unit. So there's no grease inside of this unit. There's no internal splines to grease. So it gets driven from these cogs here. And it's a little hard to see, but um, you got these cogs and then you've got wear pads in here that you can replace over time. You start seeing those get worn down, you can replace those. Um, there's also bushings in, and seals inside of the fan drive itself. And if it starts getting loose, um, you can replace those as well. But the, the drive units have a lot longer service life. You, you don't have to maintain them like you do the, the wet units. And what's interesting about this one is it's got a dry driven in it, but it has a wet driver. So if I mean it's a wet driver, it's got a grease circ right here. So there's two of them, 180 degrees from each other. And you want to hit this grease circ every 250 hours. And you want to use the, um, the TY25744 heavy duty synthetic grease in these fan drives. And then you pump grease into here until it comes out of the relief valve here in the shaft. So if you pump like 25, 30 pumps into this fan drive, it's either super empty or it's not going to, through this relief valve, it's going the path of the re least resistance. So it might be leaking past the seals and going into this cavity where this rubber boot is. So this is a rubber boot that will flex with this inner shiv as it goes forward and back. And then if you start getting a bunch of buildup, grease, or you could possibly leak hydraulic oil in there from those pistons as well, you start seeing buildup right here, you know you've got a problem and it's leaking grease out. So you lose all your grease, you start wearing on your splines and uh-oh, you got a problem. So it's really important to grease that every 250 hours and you know it's real convenient you, when you do your oil change to just go ahead and grease your fan drive as well. Just It's just part of your, you know, your general maintenance on this machine. And then if this unit were to ever fail, you can put a, a dry driver in it as well and then you wouldn't have to worry about greasing it but you know it could be you know a couple thousand dollars to upgrade that drive so um, we want to get the most service life out of this one as possible by you know making sure the belt is good and that it's greased up and also there is a, a gauge you can get from parts and i've shown that gauge on this channel before i didn't bring it with me on this one but that gauge will fit into this belt and if it the belt goes into the gauge you're supposed to replace this belt so as your width wears down on this belt you'll lose speed so the wider the belt the faster the fan drive can go and if your belt's too narrow to meet the ecu's desired speed it's going to set a low fan speed code and then also when we're in here we'll check you got a speed sensor so it's riding on the the driven shiv here and it's checking the speed on the driven. That's how we know how fast our fan is going. And we check the, the wiring going to it. And then while we're in here, we can look down here and check the oil pan gasket, the front main seal, um, the dampener on the front of the engine and all that good stuff. Okay, so one way I like to check the, the bushings and seals in this fan drive is I like to pry the, the driven open See how it takes the, the tension off that belt. And you kind of give the belt a tug while you're you're prying to shove it in that driven a little farther. See it takes the pressure off. So now we can get in here and feel this shiv and feel the bushings. Make sure we can't rock it back and forth. Feel the splines. And that feels good. If your splines were bad, you'd have a lot more slop than that. And that that's just mainly the backlash um, in the timing gears in here. So that's good. It's all tight, so we could just, you know, put our gauge on this belt, 
see if it needs replaced or not, which, you know, it's getting there, probably needs, probably go ahead and replace this belt. I'd recommend it. Um, and then grease the, the shiv up till it comes out the end of the shaft and then you should be good to go. So here we got our battery and our load center. Um, there are two batteries on the machine. There's one right on the other side that we'll look into here in a minute, but um, we check our batteries, make sure, you know, we don't have any acid leaks or corrosion built up on the cables. You know, we'll check and make sure the cables are good and tight and clean. Um, we'll go into this load center and we'll make sure all the cable connections and master fuse connections are all good and tight and there's no burn spots or any place where it's been getting hot. And if we were, you know, having troubles um, starting the engine because the batteries were low and we're charging them up and they're just not getting charged, you know, we could load test these batteries. Um, to make sure that they're good after we, you know, we charge them for a while. Um, but this tractor cranks over like a dream and starts just fine. So I think he's gonna be good to go there. Okay, so here we got the, the engine oil dipstick. We'll check the oil level here. Wipe it off, stick it back in. See where it's at, so. You know, it's time for an oil change. It's a, it's a little bit low. It's just a little under the halfway mark. Um, you don't want to get it much over um, this third dot right here, and that's all the way full. Okay, now I'm going to get the hood into service position to where we can get in and look at the top of the engine a little better. And there's um, two 18 millimeter bolts back here on this bracket that we'll take out and undo this wiring connector here for the, the hood harness, and then we'll roll this thing forward. Hey Zach, yeah. I'm gonna grab the front of this hood. I'm gonna lower it down and I'm gonna put it in service position here. So am I going up? You're gonna, well, I'm gonna ease it down toward you. Okay. I gotta, Feed this harness through as I go down. Should rest on the rock box. Okay. Right there? Yep. Alright. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so you, you guys probably noticed the this black leak coming down the side here, but that is not an oil leak, okay? That is water and, and exhaust soot that is leaking out of the seam where the two manifolds come together for the exhaust manifold, and you'll get condensation and moisture inside of that exhaust manifold, you know, when it cools down, then when you do a cold start, and those seals inside there, those those rings that seal the two manifolds together, you know, they're not they're not going to hold back that moisture, and then it's going to blow it out, and then that black sooty water leaks down here. So that's pretty normal, pretty typical uh, on these tractors, um, but don't be concerned about it because it's it's not an oil leak. And um, once the tractor warms up. It, it won't do that anymore and it'll it'll quit leaking it just kind of purges that out um, during a cold start it does make a mess but it is normal for this engine so now we'll pull this little shield off here to where we can get in and look at the, the exhaust manifold a little better okay now we'll go in and look at the exhaust manifold now we got that shield out of there um, we're looking for any blown out gaskets or broken studs stuff like that you know, looking for, you know, black soot, you know, escaping from the, the gasket. So we'll look in here. I, I can see all the way across under here and we'll check and make sure all that's good. So here we'll check the starter. It's pretty convenient right here. It's not too bad to replace it if it ever goes bad. And it's really nice working on a track tractor because you ain't got tires in your way. You can just stand right here and work on the engine. I really like working on engines on 8RTs pretty convenient for me. Um, we're gonna check the, the connections here. This is your main power cable coming from your battery here. And this is a, a jump start post right here. 
Um, so we'll check that. There's also a wire coming into here. So this is your exciter wire that's gonna engage your, your solenoid here on the, the starter. You wanna make sure that you can't pull that out and that it's not loose. That's good. And here we got our, our battery switch here. Um, so this is just killing ground. And we wanna make sure that the connections are good and tight. Also, we have a little um, LED light that flashes, flashes yellow right here. Um, that is there so you don't get out of the, like shut the tractor off and get out and just come out and just switch the battery off. It's flashing because the deaf dosing unit is, it's reversing flow and it's bringing all the deaf back to this tank right here. So here's our, our deaf tank here. So this light is gonna flash while that is um, sucking the deaf out of all the lines and everything, getting it back to the tank. So it's really important that you don't shut off this battery switch with this light blinking because then if you leave deaf in the lines, they can freeze and crystallize and then you could just have a bunch of issues later on down the road. So that's why that little um, LED light is there. Here we got our windshield washer tank right here on the side of the ladder. So we'll make sure all the hoses and the connections are good, wiring connections for the um, solenoids and stuff on it. Um, this is our, I talked about this is our def tank here. So we want to open up this lid here. Come on, there she goes. You know, make sure that everything looks good in here, that there isn't any dirt and stuff that's not supposed to be in here. We want to try to keep that really clean. You know, we're making sure the, the seal is good on the cap and all that looks good. Now we'll crawl in here and I'll get to the um, the air cleaner, and we'll check the, the engine air filters. The Sasquatch barely fits in here. It's got four locking tabs. Take those off. Here's our air filter here. So it was replaced at 989 hours. Um, we've got over 1,500 on it now. So we'll pull that guy out. Take a look at it. It looks fairly decent. You know, guy can either blow it out or replace it whenever he services it if he wants to. And then these inner filters, this one is super clean, but Deer recommends to replace this every other outer filter replacement. So I'm not sure when this one's been replaced because it doesn't have any hours written on it, but it looks good. So everything looks good there. Put this back together. All right, so I got myself tucked into here. Um, here we got our, our deaf dosing unit. So this is the pump that is um, bringing deaf from the deaf tank header down here. So we're wanting to check all the connections on the lines, make sure um, nothing's leaking, um, all the connectors for the line heaters. So this is our, our heaters for our def lines. They're, they're tied into here. So we'll check all those connectors. But this is our vent for the def tank. And look what's all over this thing. So that is what dried def turns into. So I think this def tank's been getting overfilled. So the, the fill point back behind me here is just a smidge higher then this vent is on here. So if you fill it all the way, the brim all the way up the, the fill tube, then we could get def coming up out of our vent and coming out here through this screen. So we either need to get this cleaned up or replace this vent right here because it's just caked full of a dry def. And if this vent can't breathe, then whenever this pump kicks on and we're sucking um, def from the tank, it'll actually collapse this tank. It'll start to suck in on the sides. So we want to make sure that we're properly ventilated here so we don't have any problems with def in the field. Um, and then while I'm down here, we also have a, a coolant control valve. So this engine pumps coolant through this def tank header when needed. That's why it's got this solenoid valve so we can turn that on or off. Um, so it'll pump engine coolant through um, a spiral 
going down this header into this tank to heat the def up when needed in case we're operating in super cold conditions in Minnesota. So we've got a bunch of different connections for that. We got coolant lines coming in and out, so we want to make sure we're not leaking coolant there. Um, we've got our our sensor here that's tied into our our header for um, our def level and concentration. So we'll check that, and then while we I took this shield off here, there was a a shield over this alternator. This is a, a real busy area here, so there's a lot of things to check. Um, we got our main ground, our battery ground right here, so we want to make sure it's good and tight. It allows me to get in here and look at the solenoids on the side of this IVT transmission. Uh, make sure we don't have any seals blown out on any of those solenoids. Make sure it's not leaking down the side of the transmission. Um, it allows us to look at our alternator. We'll check the, the connections on the back of it, make sure you know nothing's loose there. We'll check the, the belt, and then we've got um, our belt tensioner here, our AC compressors on the other side, and we'll check that once we get around to the other side. But here's that fan control valve I was telling you guys about that controls our fan speed. So the ECU is sending signals to, there's two solenoids here, there's one here, and then there's one around the, the side there, but, and then it's bringing oil to that fan driver and then returning it. And then we also have a vent line that's going into the top of our transmission case and then we've got all these lines that are going to the coolers and coming back so we've got you know hydraulic lines and ac lines and heater core lines and there's just all kinds of stuff mixed into this bunch but um we want to look down in here where there's some connections um, make sure we're not leaking any coolant or oil down here in these connections as well. And then we'll check the, where the, the heater core lines come and attach down here. Make sure there's no leaks. And then we can kind of peek down the back side of the transmission here. And we can check the seal on the, the back side here on, on the auxiliary drive. Make sure that it's good. And we'll try to look for any leaks or loose connections and stuff like that down in there all right so I just kind of knelt down a little bit and I got this handy dandy little hole in the side of the frame here we can go in and get a better look at the back of the, the transmission get a better look at the solenoids that are down here and all the hydraulic lines that are going into the back of the transmission make sure those are good make sure we're checking our drive shafts and that we're not missing any bolts on the couplers um, we can come in and kind of see the the airbags on the other side, right where this line's going into. That's for our air suspension. Kind of get a little bit of a peek at it right here. And there's also some belly pan shields that we can take off underneath and make sure we're not leaking anywhere down here in our where our hydraulic pumps and stuff are. So now I just jumped up on a step ladder here so I can get a better look at the top of the engine. Um, we'll look at this. This is the EGR cooler right here. Um, we'll check the clamps and all the connections on it. Make sure we're not leaking any soot out or any coolant because we have coolant running through this thing. So we've got coolant lines that we need to check and make sure um, nothing's leaking there. Um, we come up here. This is our EGR flow sensor. You know, make sure all the connections there are good. And then we can get a Peek at the top of the engine, you can see here where a mouse nest has been. We kind of smelled some burning uh, earlier when we were running the planter, and I think it was this mouse nest kind of smoldering. Um, so we want to make sure that we keep all the mice nests and uh, the bird's nest out from around this exhaust area here because they can catch on fire and uh-oh, you burn all your wiring up on top of the engine and that's real fun to get that all replaced. So go in and check this wiring make sure you know the mice that have been living in this little apartment here hasn't been snacking on our wires and we'll check the all the pipes coming in and out of the turbos so we got a twin turbo setup we've got a you know a fixed turbo feeding a variable geometry turbo here 
And so we'll check the wiring on the turbo because this uh, VGT has a speed sensor and an actuator and a position sensor in this turbo. So we got a lot of wiring here and then all connects down right here. So we'll check all that. Um, we'll also look over here and follow these, all these lines down to where they connect down here at the front of the coolers and stuff and make sure we don't have any leaks there. And then once we get back around the other side, we can check the, here's our east, where our ECU mounts right here. Um, that's a level 33 ECU on this engine. We got our coolant tank right here. When we go on the other side, we'll get a better look at it. And looking at the coolant tank is important because we need to make sure there's no oil or exhaust soot um, getting contaminated in the cooling system because that could tell us there's other stuff wrong with this engine. Looking at the turbo, um, we'll check the, the oil supply and return, make sure that they're sealing properly. Um, we, here we have the, the coolant going into um, the side of the turbo. Make sure that it's not leaking and that looks good. So far everything looks good just besides that little, that mouse nest right there, but it doesn't look like they chewed on anything. So that's wonderful. So here's another better look at the top of this engine where we can see our, our turbos here. We can check these clamps here. Look down in here. We're also checking the, uh, the rocker cover. Make sure we're not leaking on the gasket on our rocker box. We're checking the wiring. You can just see there's just all kinds of stuff on top of this engine that can go bad, and especially if mice get in here. So here we have our, this is where we're dosing fuel into the exhaust, and that's, that's our injector there, fuel dosing injector. So we got coolant lines that run through that, that dosing injector to keep it nice and cool. So we're spraying fuel into the exhaust and then it's going into this giant thing. That's where all the magic happens for our emissions. That's where our DPF and DOC and SCR systems in there. So we'll check the clamp underneath this shield here. Make sure we're not got any, you know, soot leaks coming out of there because um, any exhaust leaks on this engine is, is pretty critical to make sure you don't have any leaks because if you're, if you're leaking exhaust out, you know, either a manifold or out one of the turbo pipes or something like that, then you're not getting the proper heat that you need to passively regenerate the DPF. So we want to build as much heat as possible to naturally burn all the soot into ash in the exhaust filter so we don't have to rely on actively regenerating. When we actively regenerate, we're going to start pumping fuel into the exhaust. So all those connections are critical because if we're not building enough heat in here, there's temperature sensors that's gonna sense that and it's gonna know that there's a problem there. So we wanna make sure that there is no exhaust leaks on this engine because it'll cause emission codes. All right, so we're gonna move to the, the right-hand side of the engine here and we're gonna blaze these shields off here to get to our batteries and, and our fan drive on this side. So we got our, our coolers up front, you know, we've got a radiator and after cooler for the turbos. We've got a hydraulic cooler, we've got an AC condenser. So we want to just look at these coolers, check the fins out. You can pop these latches out right here so you can pivot these out to where you can get a, an air wand in there and blow your coolers out. And these all look super duper clean. Um, usually I get about 10 pounds of dirt blown out of these things, but these look really good. So we're just gonna look for any AC leaks or hydraulic leaks or coolant leaks. And we'll check the, you know, our pipe going into our after cooler here. Check our clamps and our little hose here that connects the two, make sure she's happy. And we'll check the, the coolant tank. Make sure the coolant looks good and clean. And that does, and it's right on the max cold. So we're good there. Um, if this tank turns black, 
or you can notice oil inside the tank, you know, that's a, that's a bad sign. So I want to make sure I just put a light on there, kind of illuminate the tank a little bit, get an idea of what it looks like. Um, here on the side of the engine, we have our water pump that is in inside here. And it's a, a cartridge type style water pump that runs off the timing gears. Um, this engine's got 1500 on it. And we normally replace those water pumps on these nine liter engines somewhere like two to 3000 hour range. So, you know, we're getting up there to where we might be thinking about um, doing a water pump, but usually when in that time range, we'll be doing a water pump and we'll be, you know, reconditioning fan drives and stuff like that, especially if we don't have um, the dry unit in there that needs more maintenance. If we had a wet driven and wet drive, we might be going in to replace bushings and seals and doing a water pump while we're in here. Um, just kind of makes it easy to do all that at one time. And then here's our high pressure pump that's pumping fuel to our high pressure common rail right here. So a lot of fuel lines to check to make sure we're not leaking fuel anywhere. So we'll take a good look at all that. Make sure we're not leaking oil out of our or crankcase ventilation system here. So this will bring crankcase crank case pressure from the, the rocker cover, and then it'll spin it in here and the oil kind of flings to the sides and then it drains down and goes back down into the, the oil pan or the, the crankcase here. So check all that. And here is our ECU. And this thing is fueled by Oh, cooled by fuel, I should say. So we've got fuel lines that are going into the ECU and out of the ECU in order to keep this thing cool. And then we'll check our connectors, make sure that's all good. We got our, this is our main engine harness. So it's gonna be green and it's wrapped in a, a Kevlar loom. And you ain't cutting through this stuff, let me tell you. So if you have a wiring problem and it's underneath this stuff, it's a, it's a booger of a time to, to repair any of the wiring. So most of the time you're just, if you got a major problem from the ECU to, to somewhere else and you can't cut through the stuff and fix it, you usually just gotta put a, an engine harness on it. So we'll make sure that's all good. Here we have our, our oil filter for the engine. And then here are our two fuel filters. Here we got our, our water bowl here. So we wanna make sure we, we drain this, there's a little drain right here where we can drain the water out. We have our uh, water and fuel separator sensor here. I want to make sure that the connector is not broken and that it's secure and you know, it doesn't come off. Then we'll look at this connection here and this is where it's bringing in air from our air cleaner and going into the turbo here. So real important here guys to make sure that our clamp connections are really good and our hose is in good condition because if we get a hole in this or we get a, a clamp that's broke, we start sucking in dirt. Uh-oh, you know, another one bites the dust is what I'm saying. You know, we'll just start be pumping dirt into the intake of this engine and, and dirt will just destroy this engine. So we wanna make sure that this is in good shape because you can just, you can trash an engine if you got a problem there. So that's really important to look at. Then if we, if we took the shield off, we can get a better look, but I think I can get it on camera. Here we've got our, our flywheel. And down here we have a hub or input hub for our IVT transmission. And there's a seal down in here and we wanna make sure that we're not leaking oil out that seal. And then we also wanna make sure that we're not leaking engine oil out our rear main seal on our engine behind this flywheel. So we'll get down in here and we'll check that. Another thing I wanna mention, if, if we did have a leak in here and we wanna pay attention to our engine hours because you gotta take this, um, this torque dampener out to get that input hub out. So if you're right around you know, that 4,000 hour mark, or so, you know, we've, we need to replace this this torque dampener every 4,500 hours. So you want to pay attention to where you're out in your engine hours if you are getting in there because you gotta 
you know, remove and install that dampener and that's a good time to replace it while you're there. Okay, so when you're servicing this engine, I wanna point out here, um, whenever you drop the oil, you wanna make sure that you open up this oil filter cap and just loosen it all the way and kind of unseat that, that filter element. So that'll allow this canister to drain like it's supposed to. So you're getting, you know, all the oil out. And then I, I generally recommend to, you know, change an oil every, you know, at least every 250 hours, um, a maximum deer says of 500 hours if you use their oil and their filter, but no more than 500, you know, but some guys, you know, will change it every hundred hours. So just, you know, some guys are particular about that, you know, 250 is kind of a, a middle range. Um, and then our, our fuel filters, we can either go every other oil change or, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to run these fuel filters, you know, any more than 600 hours. Um, 400 is kind of a, 400 hours is a pretty good point, you know, to change your, your fuel filters. Um, this one, they've got, they were changed at 1320 engine hours, so they've only got a couple hundred hours on them, but most guys, if they're servicing the engine, they just go ahead and change the fuel filters while they're there, so they don't have to worry about it in the field. And now we'll go in and take these shields off here so we can get a little better look at the AC compressor clutch and the belt and the accessory drive there. All right, so I got those shields off where we can go in and, you know, look at our, our valve here, um, check the lines on it, check the, the other, the cooling, the cooling lines coming out of the transmission and uh, make sure we're good there, checking the wiring down here. Um, this is the vent for the transmission and it's just packed full of stuff. And you wanna make sure that you clean this out you know, when you're servicing your tractor before the spring, and making sure that this thing can breathe. Because if she can't breathe, she can't cycle oil like it's supposed to between the rear axle and the transmission. And if you build up too much pressure in this transmission case, then you blow it out the, the front input seal here. So, you know, this one probably needs taken out and, and blown out real good. Um, cause whenever it gets clogged like that and it can't breathe then you know, then you just start getting oil coming out because it can't ventilate properly. It builds too much pressure and then oil starts coming out and then dirt sticks to it. And I also noticed that on our AC compressor here that the clutch is starting to get a little buildup in here, but around the front, I had some oily grimy stuff on the front of this clutch here. So I'm not sure if it's just slinging oil up from you know this vent problem here and getting up in here or if we actually are starting to leak out of the the front seal of our compressor um, but we'll snap some gauges on this thing and run the ac and we'll just see what our pressures are running okay so i got the, the ac gauge hooked up to our service ports on our ac compressor here so we'll check the the static pressure so we should be equal on, on both sides, so we're at about 55 PSI on each side, so that's good. Um, and this is pretty relative to temperature, so I, I would say it's probably around 55, you know, maybe 60 degrees in here. So our pressure is pretty relative to that temperature. So whenever we're running this, you know, our low side is gonna go down because we have a lower pressure in our evaporator core on our low side so it's going to be should be hovering somewhere you know between 10 and 30 somewhere in here and then our high side you know it's going to be much higher because you know we're going to have higher heat in the high side so our, our pressure is going to be higher and we have you know when it's in a, a liquid form so we're going to have more pressure here so we're just going to make sure that you know our low side's drawn down so we know um, our, our compressor is sucking and then if it, when it's discharging, it's coming up on the high side. So we wanna make sure that our, um, our compressor is cycling like it's supposed to. Um, if it's cycling excessively, then we might have an issue with um, a leak somewhere or you know, we got a low charge. So we wanna make sure that that's working properly. So I'm gonna fire this engine up. Okay, so we got our AC running. Both sides drawing down. 
gonna get so far and then it's gonna kick off. Our AC compressor clutch is kicked off. It's gonna go up to about 32 and it's gonna kick back on again. Okay, so we, we pressure checked the, the AC system um, with our gauges here. And you know, it's not ideal to check an AC system, you know, if it's really cold outside or um, even if it's, you know, 50, 60 degrees here in the shop. Um, I still prefer to have it, you know, whenever you actually need it, you're out in the field, you know, it's hot outside. You get a better feel for what the pressures are gonna do on your low side and high side when it's, actually hot and you actually need the air conditioning and it's you can get a better feel for you know if it's low on charge or not because at this temperature the ac system doesn't have to work very hard to get that evaporator to 32 degrees um, we have a temperature sensor in our evaporator so whenever it hits you know a certain temperature whenever the evaporator is about ready to freeze around 32 degrees or so it's going to kill the ac compressor and that's why it's cycling that's why you see the the low side go down when it kicks on and it's sucking it down getting the lower pressure and that evaporator starts getting cold because it's absorbing heat it's not putting cold into the air it's absorbing heat from the air and that heat is then getting put into um, our high side to where it can get dissipated into the air through our condenser so that's how we're able to just to get cold air we're just pulling heat from the air and we need to have um, low pressure so we can have a, the refrigerant in a gas state when it goes through our evaporator. So we want to make sure that the, the pressure is not too low because then if it's too low, then it's just kind of cycle continuously because you're going to freeze that evaporator core up a lot faster with a, with a lower pressure. So it's just going to continue to cycle. But if it's really low, it's not going to work very good, low charge. So this this um temperature in the shop it's it's kind of hard to tell if you're you could be you know half pound low and you, you probably wouldn't notice it here at this temperature but if it was 90 degrees outside you'd definitely notice it so i'm not sure if you know that that compressor is starting to leak and we just haven't leaked that much out yet and we just can't tell at this temperature the only way to know how much um, refrigerants in the system is if we actually evacuated it down and measured it, whether um, we used a, a scale or a recovering system or, or something like that to know whether, you know, it, it was slightly low. Um, you can tell sometimes with your, your static pressures and with your operating pressures when you're running if the AC is low, but it, I, what I'm saying, it's a little hard to tell at this temperature um, for me. So it seems like everything's working properly in the compressor cycling. So. Um, that oil that's on there could just be from this vent problem here where it could just be getting out on the belt and easily sling it up there on the, the AC compressor clutch. So, okay, so in here, here we got our, you know, our exhaust pipe going into our exhaust after treatment enclosure here. And we'll go ahead and we'll check all the wiring harnesses and the coolant lines and depth lines and everything coming in and out of this thing. Make sure all our wiring is good. Look under here, make sure we don't have any problems under here. And that all looks good. So down on the side here, we can see our, our air suspension. Here's our airbag. And then I notice we're sitting hard on the frame here. That tells me that, that there's no pressure in the system if it's laying on this frame right here. So this tractor has been sitting for a while, so it's probably bled all the air out. And it's a good idea to bleed all the air out of the system. And I'll show you where you do that. So you, you get all the moisture and the, you drain all the water out of the system whenever you take the pressure out. Um, it's up here. But when this tractor, we get it out and we run it and drive it and actually get moving, that compressor should kick on and start pumping air into this bag and then we should start coming up right here and we'll have a gap right here whenever that system's working properly. So we'll check that when we get back to the back. All right, now I'm down on the ground on the creeper here and I slid underneath the front and I can look through these shields 
and make sure that we don't have any leaks at the bottom of our coolers. Make sure our our lower radiator hose isn't seeping. Because, you know, if it was, there'd just be coolant all over this and everything's just good and dry. So we're good there. And on back a little further, we have our, our radar sensor right here. So this is measuring actual ground speed. So we want to make sure that it's not damaged and that the wiring all looks good there. Then we'll look at the, the front of the IVT transmission. And then that gives us a good opportunity to look in here at the back of our oil pan and flywheel area to make sure we don't have any oil leaks there. That all looks good. Bottom transmission's all dry. So a little further back, I'm back behind the transmission here. Give us a good look at the back of the transmission. Make sure we don't have any leaks. And this shield can come off here too, and that'll expose our RU and CU control valves on the bottom of the transmission and some lines, but that all looks good. Um, there is a, I don't know if you can see it. Okay, see this plug behind the solenoid here? So that is where we would take our sump screen out of the transmission. And there's also a plug directly underneath it here. So, you could take those plugs out and you could look at that screen through here and through this hole here. You know, whenever you're doing, um, changing all the oil in the transmission and the rear axle, when you drain it, you want to look at that screen real good to make sure you don't have any black plastic chunks or any metal, anything on that screen that could indicate a transmission failure. So I'm back a little further. We've got our our shock for our suspension system. And then we also have our position sensor that tells us where the suspension system is in height. So that is our height sensor for the, the suspension. When we look back here, we can go in and look at all our pumps, make sure we're just mainly checking for leaks. Yeah, here we got a, our hydraulic, one of the hydraulic filters and it's never been changed before because it's green, so that needs changed. And then we're just looking for leaks in here. We need to check that, change that filter. Look at our, our drive shafts. Everything looks good there. And then if, if we did see a leak in here, we could take this belly pan off and look into it a little further. But usually when you got a hydraulic oil leak, this pan will just be nasty. You know, it'll just be covered in oil and dirt and mud and everything. So everything looks good and dry in here. So a little further back, we have our, our final drive assembly here. And we want to make sure that all these bolts are in place and accounted for and tight, not coming loose, not broke off. Um, I've seen these break off before. So you want to make sure that all your bolts are there and then check your axle seal and make sure you're not leaking any oil here. Well, I've been digging for a while. I got a pile of fluff here on the floor because I've been trying to get it. It was just all packed into here. So here's our, our steering motor and lines. And we're just going to check all these lines, make sure um, nothing's leaking. Make sure that our, our wiring harnesses, our clips are in place because this one was not in place. And so there was another one up here and this whole harness was just dangling in here. So I wanted to make sure we got the clips back on there. But what I wanted to show you is this back behind our, our rock shaft for the, the three point edge here. Back in here, underneath this cover, that is where our, um, our air suspension compressor is back here in our control valve. And there's a pressure sensor that goes in this block here, but underneath it, I don't know if I can, if you can see, but there is a drain valve right here on the bottom. And you just kind of move it to the side and drain the water out. You see how much water is sitting in there. So if you leave that water in there and let it sit, you know, over time, these, um, the valve and all those lines and everything are just going to get a bunch of rust built up in them. And then eventually they'll close shut to where your, 
your suspension system won't work properly. And if this thing can't air up and you lose all your air pressure or you got a, a leak somewhere, um, this will actually um, derate your, your, your speed. So it'll only allow you to go so many mile an hour if you ain't got no pressure in your air suspension. So, and then sometimes you get a bunch of rust built up in here. This valve, when you go to drain it, it will leak. It'll get all that crap stuck in that valve and then it won't seal properly and then it'll just leak. So whenever you do crack that, you wanna make sure that this is sealing back up again. But if you're gonna put the tractor away, you know, at the end of the season, it's a good idea to just go ahead and drain that down and drain all the water out of it. So here we got our, our rock shaft and we'll go ahead and make sure nothing's leaking. Um, this is our hitch position sensor. So we wanna make sure the linkage for that is all good and tight. And it's gonna have a little bit of play at the sensor that its bolts are good and tight, ain't moving around. Here we're back underneath the tractor again. So on the left side, underneath the tractor, here we got our main hydraulic pump. Here's our main suction line into the pump. And we wanna, we can see our filters. They're still green. Those filters have 1500 hours on them. So we wanna make sure we get those filters replaced. And there's a, black cover here on the outside You take that cover off and then those filters are sticking out here and then you just spin them off and replace them. But everything looks good there just besides needing the filters changed. And then looking for leaks, checking wiring all up the side and I've got more shucks to remove. All right, so I got all this dug out cleaned up a little better so I can get in here. And I mainly wanted to look at this wiring to make sure it wasn't rubbing on this line right here like it was. It was rubbing right here. So I moved the clips to where it's not rubbing on this hydraulic line anymore. Um, I've had troubles with wires getting rubbed through in here. So I wanted to check that. Um, allows me to check the, the primary resolution manifold and all the lines and fittings and sensors going into that and that all looks good. I checked the, all my final drive bolts and they're all accounted and present. And then we'll check the connections back here on the steering and braking backup pump. This is an electric motor that's gonna turn a pump um, when, in case you lose main hydraulic pressure when you're running down the road so you can get this thing steered and stopped. So we'll check these lines coming in here, make sure all our clamps are in position, especially down in here. I wanna make sure there's a clamp that goes in here. I wanna make sure that that's good. Got some lines down here. All that looks good. So, so far, all our hydraulic connections on this tractor are in good shape. So I'm down here on the back side, and right here is our sight gauge for our hydraulic oil level. And we wanna make sure that it is in between the two lines or at the top of the line with the hitch down. So you always wanna check that with the hitch down so you've got you know, most of the oils retracted from the, the lift cylinders on the hitch. And this one seems good, but I think we've got about you know 1500 hours on the, the oil, so it wouldn't be a bad idea to go ahead and change um, the hydraulic oil, so you would drain it out of the rear axle and the transmission and fill up with new oil. Okay, so here we've got our stack of SCVs. Um, this tractor is pretty cool because it's got um, six SCVs installed. So, you know, you got options for activities. So normally I would have a hydraulic flow meter in a pressure test kit with me, but I wasn't able to bring that on this trip, unfortunately. So um, what we would do is, you know, we'd have all our hoses unplugged and then we would go in and pressure check each coupler 
on each SCV to make sure that um, our pressure isn't bleeding off. So we would pressurize a, a hose with a gauge on the end of it to 3000 PSI and then we would stop the flow and then we would make sure that the pressure doesn't bleed off, that it holds it. And then we would do that on every single port. And then we would go in and hook a flow meter into the SCVs and then we would um, deadhead one of the SCVs to fully stroke our pump. And then we would flow test the SCVs and make sure that we were getting the gallon per minute spec that John Deere says that this machine is supposed to have. So we would do that with a flow meter so we could check to make sure that our SCVs are flowing the way that Deere wants them to flow. And so we can't do that, but you know, we have pretty much tested these SCVs with all the, the operations we've been doing on this planer. Nothing's leaking off, uh, you know, the mainframe's not leaking off. So it's holding pressure like it's supposed to. So we're just gonna call that good for now, but I'm just letting you know that's something that I would do uh, if I was back at the shop during a normal tractor inspection. And then each one of these is a controller. Okay, so, you know, we've got six SCVs and then a hitch right here. This is our, our hitch controller. So we would check the connectors and the wiring for all the SCVs and the hitch and make sure that's all good to go. And then also we're looking for leaks in between each valve to make sure that they're not leaking. And then, you know, we're checking for leaks in between the barrels. So each barrel has a drain tube. There's two of them on each one. So you wanna make sure that, you know, we don't have a cut o-ring or something where it's leaking down the side. And then, you know, of course we're checking the seals and the couplers on inside the barrel itself. So unfortunately we can't do all the testing that I would normally do on a full-blown tractor inspection here, but we got the basis covered with just operating the planer and everything works like it's supposed to, so we're gonna call that good. So another maintenance item I wanna point out, we've got grease points on this three-point hitch. So, you know, we've got one here and at the bottom of the cylinder, and then we've got uh, a grease circ on each side of the rock shaft and we want to make sure that we're greasing all the points on this three point to keep this thing going up and down like it should. Um, sometimes you can get one of these pins froze up in the cylinder and then your hitch won't move. And, and it could be a booger to get those things freed up again. So keeping it lubed is a pretty easy thing to, to do to keep that from locking up on you. So up here on the back side of the cab we've got a vent for our fuel tanks so you want to make sure that that vent stays clean if it gets all plugged up with dirt and stuff then you won't be able to draw fuel from the tanks like you're supposed to so keep an eye on that blow that guy off when she gets dirty action okay so we're going to talk about uh, track maintenance so this guy's got a 25 inch track on it which i like better um they ride better um, they wear better. Some guys will run an 18 inch track if they're, you know, side dressing and stuff like that with it. But this one's got a 25 inch track and the treads are all in really good shape. Um, a lot of the times we'll get a lot of wear on the inside. So these lugs will be wore more than this side. So at that point in time, you got to make a decision whether you want to rotate the tracks. So we will go in and jack this thing up and detension the tracks and then We'll rotate the tracks from side to side so then we can wear, you know, have a, a newer lug on the inside. So we're wearing the track down as evenly as possible over time because if you wear this down too far, you know, the track's basically ruined. There's, there comes a point in time where you can't rotate it anymore. It, it doesn't make sense. So you want to make sure that you're rotating your tracks and getting all the life out of them that you possibly can. Um, through Sloan's Express, we have a, a Clearview cap kit. So these caps replace these metal caps here, and that'll allow you to see your oil level. You know, you'll be able to visually inspect it. And these are, the bigger ones are for the, the main idlers, and then we have the smaller ones here that go on your mid rollers. So that's a really nice kit through Sloan's Express that you can get 
especially like right now this this tractor's got 1500 hours on it and i normally change the hub oil at a thousand so we'll take the the caps off and then we'll flush them out real good because there'll be a little bit of metallic grime in there so we want to get that flushed out and cleaned and then we'll fill it full of clean oil but that'd be a good time to put these caps on because you already got it off because you got to take those caps off and drain the oil to put these in so that'd be a good time to upgrade for these um, we also have mid rollers through Sloan's Express so this is made by Camso and this is a poly roller so the poly ones last a lot longer longer they handle heat better um, these rubber ones over time they'll start chunking out on the on the ends here and once you get you know so far in a couple inches in you know you're going to need to replace that roller so at that time it's a, a good decision to upgrade to a poly wheel and put them on there they're a little bit more money but i think it's still it's definitely worth it they last a lot longer handle the heat better so if you're you're going through the trouble of detensioning the tracks and lifting these track frames up and spending the labor on it, you might as well put something on there that's going to last a little longer. And then when we're looking at the tracks, you know, we're checking all the mid rollers, all the rubber condition. We're checking the rubber condition here on the idlers, the front idlers here. So these front idlers is what's controlling the track alignment. So right here, this is where we would adjust the track alignment. You take this bolt out here, you take this lock plate out, and then you've got a screw on each side. And there's a guide here that'll tell you which way you need to turn this screw. And it shows arrows which direction the track's gonna go. So what I do, say if we needed to move the track, you know, that way, we would take these off of both sides and then we would loosen that other side, you know, maybe a turn, turn and a half or so. And then we would tighten this one a turn and a half and get it tight. And then we would get the tractor on the flattest ground that we possibly could. And then we would drive it forward and drive it back. And it's a good idea to add some talc or floor dry in here to lubricate your track while you're doing the alignment just to make sure that it's moving like it's supposed to. Sometimes you'll make an adjustment and you'll drive it back and forth and it won't move. And you'll keep making an adjustment, keep making an adjustment, and then all of a sudden you're to the other side. So it can be a little finicky to align the tracks on here, but lubricating them kind of helps in that process. And when I'm looking at these, these lugs here in the center, we're looking at wear on here. As you can see that these are chunking out a little bit. And that happens whenever the track, the lugs are rubbing on the inside of these wheels and the mid rollers. And it's gonna happen naturally as you run the machine. They, they don't run dead center all the time. You know, as you're turning and putting loads on the tractor, it's going to move inside of there, but you don't want it rubbing on one side all the time. So if the track was out of alignment, it would just be getting hot on this one side and this side would be cold because it's not touching anything. And then it'll just start chunking out really bad on one side. And that's just the rubber getting so hot that it you know, kind of starts to melt and it'll like create a bubble in the rubber and then it'll just, it'll just cut it out. So we make sure that we're getting even wear on both sides. So when I feel this, this lug, the wear on each side is pretty similar. You know, if you got one side that's just super smooth and then the other side, you know, looks like this or maybe a little worse, that tells me that, you know, the track's been rubbing on that side. So then we would, you know, recommend to align the tracks to the customer and then we would do that procedure later on the repairs. Because it, it can take like half a day to align a track sometimes. Sometimes they'll, they'll go real easy for you and then sometimes they'll just fight you tooth and nail. So... When I'm checking the tracks, I'll take it out for a drive. You know, I'll just take it down the road and get the tracks real hot. And then I'll come back and you can just take your hand and you feel here and you feel here. So they should feel the same temperature between inside and outside. If this feels cold and then this feels hot and it feels like tacky and sticky, then we know we're rubbing really hard on one 
side. Then we kind of take an eyeball down here and maybe stick our hand in here and we're checking the distance between the wheel and the lug here. See right now, the way the tractor's sitting, see I can stick my hand completely in this side, but this side I can barely get to the first knuckle. So, and that just could be because we, you know, turned the, the tractor real hard to move the planter. So, but in order to properly check that, you have to drive like 400 feet in a straight line, as straight as you possibly can. Then you're gonna come in here and you're going to feel and check for the gaps. And I just, I just use my hand. They have a special tool that you can stick down in here. So when you're checking the, the distance between the mid roller and the lug, there's a special tool that'll go in here and check that gap and it should fit on both sides. But I've been doing it long enough where I just use my hand and my eyes and look at it. And sometimes you just, you can't get them to run dead middle. I mean, you could be working all day trying to get these tracks aligned. And as long as you get it barely close to the middle, but it's not rubbing and getting hot on one side after you drive it for a while, then it's fine. And then also you want to check the rubber on these drive wheels right here. I mean, I've seen nails and antlers and you know, all kinds of foreign objects get lodged in here or it'll cut and take a chunk out of these drive wheels. So it's a good idea to have somebody in the tractor whenever you're maybe checking your track alignment and you're going back and forth so you can roll this wheel and, and somebody's just kind of following along and, and looking at the drive wheels. So we'll look at the drive wheels and the front idler wheels and make sure there's no damage or any excessive wear on the rubber there. And then on our hubs, we've got high guard in these hubs. And I generally change these at a, at a thousand hours. So we'll take these plugs out here. And this is a, a three quarter plug. And I'll just get this busted loose. And then I like to put some kind of way to funnel the oil just in case the, the hub is, is really full. And I don't want to fill this whole cavity in this mid roller with oil. So I'll just stick a funnel under it. And these are just got a high guard in them. So it is right at the, at the hole. You see there. And it, it looks pretty clean. I mean, that's just the dirt from the hub on my finger. It doesn't look too bad. But if they've got a thousand hours on them, it's a good idea to just go ahead and change them. It's not that hard to do. Um, I go ahead and I, I get all the O-rings for all the hubs and the front idlers. Um, whenever I take that cap off, I always put a fresh O-ring in. And then you just fill, once you get the cap torqued back on, then we're just filling through this plug right here. So we'll just go through each one of these hubs so we've got six mid rollers on each track, and then we've got two uh, hubs on the idlers on each track. So, and each one's got a plug just like this, and we're gonna go in and check all the oil levels. Make sure we got one that's not bone dry or something, or oil looks burnt or smells funky. How's your side looking? So far, decent. If they don't run out, I've stuck a flashlight in there and it's right there. Yep. Yeah, mine either was just right there or it just barely That's ran out. That's the way out. these have all been, yeah. So I got those, I got the three tough ones now. Nice. But these are nice, you can just wheel right in there. Yep. So here we have our, our track tensioning cylinder. And then this is our accumulator. And then we have a pressure sensor right here on both sides. Um, this thing can sometimes get broken or the connector gets broken and it'll cause a, you know, a steering redundancy code and will uh, slow you down. It'll derate your speed. 
So you want to make sure that the wiring is good on those and then <clears throat> get the, the dirt cleaned off of here so you can get to these grease points here. So you got a greaser here that needs to be greased. And then we'll take a look in here. It's kind of hard to see. There, I cleaned some dirt from it, but now you can see that grease circ where that cylinder attaches up there. So you want to make sure you're keeping those things greased. Okay, while well, I was working on the tractor, getting that all inspected, Caleb was finishing up the rest of the planter and going through it. So what all did you do today? So basically we just did that, uh, that video of the row unit takedown that we did. We just did that on every single row and we made all our adjustments. We put in all the bowls, we put in all the agitator strips, we took all the brush belts apart, checked everything, made sure there was no wear anywhere, uh, checked all our gauge wheels, adjusted most of the gauge wheels um, to get the right contact on the gauge wheels, checked a few more openers, uh, checked the contact points. So basically just repeated the same thing that we did on that other video 24 times. And then uh, found one small hydraulic leak. We're gonna need to get a hose for that. Um, but other than that, we're putting a fork in this baby. All right, she's done. Uh, Hi, right. I'm Zach. <laughs> I'm Zeth, and we're going to go ahead and wrap this video up. That's going to make it for part three. So um, appreciate you guys watching. If you can like and subscribe to the channel, that'd be awesome. And keep that green iron moving. We appreciate everything that you guys have done so far to support this channel. And thank you for bringing us on. I really appreciate it. Thank you guys for coming all the way up here. Yeah, it was fun, man. Yeah. It was fun. Well, now you gave me stuff to fix, so I guess yeah. thank you. Yeah, now you got work to do. <laughs> yeah, you're a little, welcome. A little bit, a little bit. But your planner's good to go now. Yep. You know, just got a couple little things to do on the planner, and then she's ready to rock, you know. Not yep. a whole lot to do with the tractor, just, you know, some basic maintenance yep. to do on it, and it's all done. So, yeah, you're looking in good shape, man. I think so. We, we got a head start now, because it's still only February, so. Yeah. Yeah, we'll be ready to rock. Ready to yeah. All right. Thanks for watching, guys. Thank you.